today about our um, re uh, recent work on design of context aware safety monitors for medical CPS. So as you all know, uh, medical devices are pervasive in our lives. They range from these tiny implantable devices such as pacemakers uh, or insulin pumps to hospital devices such as uh, infusion pumps to more complex machines for surgery or radiation therapy. So by nature, because they're, they're dealing with patients, they're all safety critical devices. And actually um, recently with the kind of um, advances in machine learning and AI, like the recent set of the art people are really trying to actually design these devices that are embedding AI and machine learning as the controllers for uh, real time health monitoring. And two applications, for example, in my group that uh, we work on are artificial pancreas systems and um, uh, smart agents for emergency medical services. So in this, um, you see that in all these different examples that I've shown so far, like there is this kind of challenge of how to have the kind of satisfied device functionality, but also ensure the safety and security. And this is actually not an easy task. And this is evident by lots of uh, data that has been kind of reported on actually the safety and security vulnerabilities of these devices. We did actually ourselves uh, did an, a study of uh, the FDA publicly available data on uh, recalls and adverse events of medical devices um, up to 2013. So this data might be a little bit like old, but I, I think that trends are always increasing even worse than what I'm showing here. So there were over 17,000 recalls affecting more than 18 million devices and uh, the users and medical professionals that are kind of dealing with these devices every day, they reported over two and, uh, two and a half million adverse events reports on these devices. And when you look at the kind of the reports, the real causes for these are either accidental faults, like things like uh, deficiencies in the software, design algorithm, or in the hardware. Uh, sometimes also there are vulnerabilities in the system that actually le leads the uh, attackers to be able to actually compromise the system functionality or actually um, kind of make it unavailable from, uh, for, to be used by the um, healthcare professionals. So some of these are actually actual events that happen. Some of them are kind of potential vulnerabilities that might be kind of compromised. So there are also like lots of reports on human errors and uh, kind of mechanical, electrical kind of malfunctions. You see some examples here from surgery, but all, also I should say that sometimes it's very hard to just kind of attribute a kind of event to one single cause. So sometimes when you look at the overall report, basically there is no one root cause that you can actually find. And um, oftentimes actually one event happens and then multiple causes actually play together, multiple contributing causes uh, we will have in one incident. And uh, as I said, this is just a tip of iceberg. Uh, a very recent report, 2019, this was actually an award-winning article, found that actually um, many of these reports are they don't, their events are they don't get reported, or if they get reported, uh, a portion of them they don't get uh, made public um, so that we can actually see them and understand what's going on. So anyway, so this is actually an important problem, although it's hidden. And uh, I want to today talk about one of the very uh, kind of most complex devices that are on the market for um, kind of teleoperated surgery and some of the work that we are doing on safety and security of these systems. So uh, these are one of the examples of one of the most complex uh, human in the loop CPS. So we have a couple of surgeons sitting at a surgical console, uh, kind of uh, receiving 3D magnified views of surgical field um, at the console. And they sometimes they collaborate together on one case, actually at UVA they do it often. And they use uh, joystick-like manipulators to operate uh, robotic arms that carry very tiny instruments going into patient's body. And uh, there are also like uh, other human operators in the room trying to help and coordinate with like uh, everything. So as a whole, this system is very complex. You have mechanical, electronic, and software components dealing with operators. And uh, although the system is not uh, autonomous yet, uh, it's actually kind of following the surgeon's commands. It is exactly like what the surgeon wants to do. But it's, it has the limitation that it's actually loosely closed loop, meaning that it doesn't have, at least the current generation doesn't have any haptic feedback. And the vision feedback is kind of limited because uh, at the same time, the surgeon need to actually control the camera and uh, see, have the right field of view. And we'll talk about this more uh, in my presentation. So um, as a whole, this system is actually just one instance of devices that go into a hospital network. And as at the time of design of these devices, it was envisioned that in the future we will have remote surgery. Actually, uh, experimentally, this has been done, but not in practice yet. So you, you will have a surgeon that actually operates on a patient in a remote area in a battlefield. And then uh, we will use a kind of a secure connection to actually send packets or commands to the robot control system of the robot. 
Uh, currently, actually, they use this kind of remote connection for technical uh, support. So sometimes even there are kind of problems with the system, a technical a technician from a kind of company might actually be able to kind of connect and see what is going on, up upload the data or like download it and so on. So there are several, I mean, as you see, it's a very kind of complex system as a whole, and there are several sources of kind of possibilities for attack or like failures that might happen. And ensuring that the operation is actually done safely and securely is actually a very challenging task. So we did actually also looked into 14 years of FDA data on these devices specifically. And we found that on average for the data we looked at, there is uh, in one every 100 robotic procedures, there is a chance of an unexpected event happening. And these actually affect the patients and caregivers by causing complications during surgery, uh, making the procedure longer, or just try leading it to cancel or um, kind of being done at the, at the later time. So the specific kind of events that we are interested in in our research is the kind of um, uh, unexpected robotic movements or behavior during at a critical time during surgery that, for example, a kind of um, incorrect position or orientation or unexpected position orientation or uh, angle or force that might actually cause this robot to harm the patient. And if you look at actually the past uh, studies and reports, there's again several causes for this. One of the main issues is that the, uh, because of the limited uh, field of view, it's possible for the human operators to not actually see all the instruments or like the whole surgical field when they're actually operating. So off-camera injuries is actually very common. Somebody might have actually the instrument uh, kind of not in the view of the camera and then do something, uh, I mean, have a kind of a movement that is not uh, expected. There is also because of lack of uh, haptic feedback, you might actually have a high force kind of movements that actually cause uh, kind of uh, complications. Uh, there are also kind of reports that uh, show there is possibility for, actually there are uh, published work and studies that show there is possibility for attackers to do denial of service attacks or man in the middle attacks, compromising the communication between the master console, the surgeon console, and the control software of the robot, um, causing the packets to be kind of dropped or like the robot system become unavailable. Uh, we ourselves looked at to, uh, kind of the attacks that might actually uh, compromise the control system itself. So there are previous reports by the companies that they do security analysis of these hospital systems that they showed, uh, although the robot system is actually protected with firewalls and kind of having a private VLAN, but there are kind of possibility for failures in the firewall system that leaves the robot open uh, to the kind of attackers that might actually have their foot in the hospital network. And uh, we showed the possibility of a smart malware that can be deployed remotely in the control software of the robot and try to inject malicious faults at critical times during surgery. So the goal uh, of our research is actually to try to kind of uh, minimize the impact of this all different types of errors, specifically unintended human errors and hardware and software um, kind of faults or kind of malicious attacks. So in my research, we actually uh, focus on three main approaches. One is that we develop uh, techniques and tools in order to analyze the real data from the field on the security and safety incidents, in order to learn from the past data, what are the patterns or like kind of types of failures or uh, attacks that happen what are the causes? And then we use this kind of studies usually to enable to um, mimic or like kind of simulate this kind of events uh, in simulation environments in real, also realistic test beds in order to assess the resilience of the systems that we are studying or like actually evaluate the systems that I mean, monitoring techniques that we are building. So in our lab, we actually always build like uh, hardware software test beds. We have actually a robot platform Raven, which is an open source uh, platform for robotic research. And we also, for other devices that I also explain, we always have like real hardware software test beds that we do this kind of testing on. And the third part of our research is actually uh, uh, kind of dealing with a design of monitoring mechanisms that can be integrated with the controller of a medical device and um, our CPS in general. And they can actually in, in real time detect early signs of um, uh, unexpected behavior or errors that if they're not corrected or stopped, they might actually lead to adverse consequences. So two things is key here is that uh, we are trying to be real time. Basically, we are trying to prevent uh, events from happening. So there are lots of work in like CPS and like kind of safety monitoring that they actually detect things after it has happened. But our, our goal is to be preemptive and preventive, try to not let things to happen. Uh, so that's one thing. And the other thing is to be able to actually um, uh, issue corrective actions. So one of the 
um, things after you detect something is wrong, what you can do about it? Should you actually send alert or you should uh, take any corrective action? So I want to talk about this third part today and uh, in the context of surgical robots. Um, so uh, what is, so probably some of you have heard about the kind of the uh, research on, the, on runtime verification, real-time monitoring. So these are lots of work being done in this area and especially in CPS as well. And what we kind of our approach to this is actually more from a control uh, theoretic perspective. We try to model and analyze safety um, uh, mainly following like uh, kind of uh, basically a kind of the design, uh, methodology proposed by Nancy Leveson at MIT that we try to actually look into uh, overall control system of the um, kind of a CPS or like a medical device, including the human operators, the patients, the physical device that is in the loop and try to look into uh, different kinds of um, faults, malicious or accidental that might happen at different layers of the control structure. And once they happen, they actually violate the safety constraints for different loops. Um, so this loop might be actually the loop between the human operator and the automated controller or the automated controller and the physical process and or the patient and the human operator. So, um, so in order to do this and also be able to be preventive, uh, what we are focused on mainly is to be able to detect if there is any con uh, control action that is going to be uh, issued by the controller uh, to the physical process, basically going from the cyber layer from the software to the kind of the hardware, like the physical process that is going to execute that control action. And we try to detect that unsafe control action before it's actually executed on the physical layer. So if you look at the kind of a typical control loop, it has the sensing estimation, it has some process model that actually tries to uh, kind of decide under what control action to issue. And any of these kind of um, kind of components in a control loop might be actually a source of error, like they might actually sensing errors or like kind of control algorithm, or even the actuator itself. But what we are trying to do is basically try to kind of detect any faults or errors on this right portion in order to detect uh, unsafe control actions before they happen. So what is important here is that um, it's not only like the value of the control action or like the type of control action that is being kind of issued, is also the, more important than is the timing and the duration of the control action. Because as you know, depending on the, what control system we have, there, I mean, it, there, there are different kind of, uh, it might take different amounts of time, for example, a robot versus a kind of a chemical plant versus an autonomous car, so that the control action really actually impacts the physical state of the, physical state of the uh, system and then uh, will actually cause a hazard. So what is important is that we need to also consider what is the underlying system condition or what I call a context, the system context that uh, this co uh, control action is provided so that we decide that if this control action is safe or not. So one type of control action might be safe in one time in one state, but it might be unsafe in another uh, time. So we, we consider, uh, basically we try to model uh, the multidimensional context of the system uh, including the human operators, the patient, and the cyber state, and then uh, try to learn from the data and also the knowledge sources that we have that when the control actions in each of these states uh, are issued, they're uh, kind of unsafe. So if you look at the traditional kind of uh, fault propagation timeline from dependability kind of standpoint, so usually like what happens is that the faults when they kind of originate in the any layer of the system software or hardware, they will take some time into uh, until they actually manifest. They actually cause an erroneous state in the computer, I mean, uh, computational error in the system. And some of them actually get masked, they don't get activated. Uh, but in terms of like, this control system that I was talking about, also it takes some time until this unsafe control action is actually issued and it goes to the physical layer. So our detector is our, our monitor is supposed to be integrated with the controller of the system, only having access to the input and output of the device. Basically, we try to not be intrusive because we know that many of these devices don't share their source code. We just want to know what is the input and output, basically the control action that is being issued and the sensing uh, data that is being um, kind of um, measured from the sensors or from coming commands from the human operator. And our monitor is trying to detect if this control action given the current state is safe or unsafe. And hopefully we have some early evidence that shows that by this approach, we can actually achieve better uh, accuracy and we can also be early. So we can, sometimes we can be actually early in detection of hazards. So it gives us some chance to be preventive or like uh, issue some corrective action. So, um, so this is uh, the general approach that we have for context our safety monitoring. So we uh, basically do two things. One is that we need to take into account the physical uh, 
uh, process state. So basically, what is the state of the robot in real world or like the patient that is we are actually controlling? So we need to do uh, some modeling and simulation uh, of the behavior and like kind of um, dynamic behavior and uncertain behavior of this physical process. And then uh, use that in order to kind of identify the context. On the other hand, we need to also uh, have um, sometimes new sensing uh, kind of techniques and also inference techniques in order to understand what is the intention of the human or what is the human is trying to do? What is the operational flow that it has, uh, he or she has? And also what is the status of the patient? So putting these two together and actually most, I mean, is a combination of both knowledge and data. So sometimes we need to learn from the past data, but often we also need to uh, kind of uh, rely on the knowledge sources, for example, what we know about uh, the kind of the operational workflow of a responder or like a surgeon and then try to encode it in order to actually uh, better do the inference and kind of modeling. Uh, and then putting this together, we actually provide this information to the safety monitor so that we have a kind of a full picture of the context at different layers of the system, and then decide if the control action in that context is safe or not. So in the case of surgery, if I want to actually show the kind of higher kind of control structure, it's kind of similar. So we have the human surgeons, the master console, and then we have control software, control hardware, and the robotic arms and instruments. So you already see that there are multiple kind of control loops here. And then uh, in terms of context, uh, so our goal is actually to insert a safety monitor at the latest computational stage after the control software, before the commands go out to the physical uh, robot, to the hardware components. And then um, the three levels of uh, context that we consider here are operational context. Basically, what is the workflow of the surgery? What the surgeon is actually trying to do? We try to actually under take that into account. The other layer is the cyber context. That's what normally like all the anomaly detection techniques do. So basically just consider the control system state. Uh, what is the state of the robot? What is its position orientation and so on? And also we take into account the physical context. Uh, and this is usually predictive, meaning that we try to estimate given what, what, what was the state before, what would be the next state or like kind of the next step of the um, uh, physical uh, uh, robot or like the patient, if I actually issue this control command to it. So we have, I want to talk about two works that we did. Uh, so actually um, the first one is, would be like to integrate the physical context with the uh, cyber context. Um, basically developing a dynamic model of the physical robot in order to predict what will be the next state of the robot if I issue this command before I issue it. And then also a work that we did uh, recently uh, published at DSM 2020 on um, operational context, uh, how to infer what the surgeon is doing and then use that in order to detect the unsafe behavior. So, uh, so for the, uh, just a little background for the case study that we use in this work, uh, we have a kind of an open source platform called uh, Raven, uh, which is a surgical robot. Uh, it has open source hardware and software for us uh, so that we can very modify it, add our monitor to it. And also um, it's actually, um, it can carry the uh, instruments that uh, the actual Da Vinci robot uh, commercial one has. And we have uh, augmented this, uh, the software of this robot in our lab uh, with um, uh, kind of an autonomous agent that can do motion planning and uh, also like perception. Uh, so we use that for generating like uh, new trajectory data for testing our kind of techniques. We have also developed a simulation environment for Raven based on ROS Gazebo, which is a robotic operating system uh, simulation, 3D simulation environment. And this actually enables us to do lots of kind of uh, simulations, inject faults and then um, security attacks and see their behavior, test our monitors without causing uh, damage to our actual robot. So we have done also like lots of uh, experiments with our actual robot and we have kind of damaged it several times, but because just how, how long does it, how it takes for fixing it and uh, kind of um, some of the <laughs> errors are not recoverable. We prefer to do things, do things in simulation, but we also, also verify examples of these faults in uh, actual hardware to make sure that they're realistic. Um, so um, here's just a kind of a, a quick video of like how Raven looks like. So these are actually ju just a two arm robot. It has um, kind of here, we are not having a kind of an arm for the camera like in the actual Da Vinci robot. We also recently has de have developed in our group a kind of an arm that can autonomously move the camera and then follow the end effectors of the um, um, instruments uh, as the kind of the task is being done. And this is done in a dry lab kind of setting. This video is specifically is actually from Biorobotics Lab at the University of Washington when I was collaborating with them back then. Uh, 
so here is the kind of how the control system of Raven looks like. So uh, inside the control software, we have a multi-threaded application that is running on top of a real-time operating system. So we have a kind of a uh, RT preempt version of Linux that uh, these tasks are, are, I mean, the ROS and these tasks are, are running on top of it. And uh, everything that we have in this software, the control software should be uh, executed within the time constraint of one millisecond. So this is just was done in order to make sure that because we have a human operator in the loop that actually issues commands uh, kind of every uh, kind of maybe fractions of milliseconds or like in many milliseconds, it, it needs to actually see the kind of a response. So the safety uh, real time constraint that we have for this control system is one millisecond. And that's actually a very tight constraint for us in terms of design of the safety monitor, because if you want to actually have the safety monitor in the path of the control loop and then checking on these commands, it should also do all the computations within this time uh, constraint that we have. And we are thinking about actually, as our monitor is getting more complex, we are thinking to actually use hardware techniques in order to kind of accelerate the uh, monitoring uh, in real time. So um, so one of the things is that this uh, the Raven, uh, uh, robot already comes with safety checks that they do on the commands that is going to be sent from the software to the hardware. The safety checks are done at least uh, in Raven. Uh, we are not sure how the DaVinci handles the, the commercial robots, but in this one, they actually do uh, basically safety checks on the maximum um, kind of safe uh, value of the torque commands that are going to be delivered to the physical robot. So that, that is actually learned from experience that for example, uh, based, based on how much kind of uh, flexibility from the human operator versus safety you want to have, they set some thresholds to say that the, uh, if the command is going to be deviating more than this value, then we actually uh, raise an alert or just don't let the command to be delivered. But there are two problems. One is that this ter uh, these thresholds are ad hoc. So they're actually, we find many cases that uh, they cause false alarms or they don't detect some of the kind of um, unsafe commands. Another problem is that from the time that the safety checks are done in the software until the actual command, the torque command is delivered to the uh, digital to analog converters and then goes to the physical robot uh, motor controllers, there is this gap that we call it the time of check to the time of use. So in this time gap, which is that basically there is still computational elements involved and some of them are in software in the ROS or in the RTOS that we have and also in the uh, USB board, some of them in hardware. Uh, there is a still a chance for attacker if, I mean, we have a smart kind of malicious party to actually go and corrupt the commands after they were checked in the software. Um, and, um, and there are also like possibilities, like even maybe there are faults in this kind of components that actually cause the commands to go wrong. So the, in order to actually um, kind of overcome these two problems, one was the kind of the accuracy of the safety checking and the other one was the kind of still this kind of gap in uh, safety checking that we have. Uh, we proposed the uh, kind of a new monitor, which we it actually comp compares, uh, uh, combines the cyber and the physical context uh, information in order to do the safety checks. So what we do is that we actually, um, um, in order to close the gap, we actually add uh, the uh, safety checking at the latest computational stage, basically just before, I mean, or you can even inside, put it inside the interface board, like just uh, at the very latest computational stage in the software. Uh, and then um, we, what we do in this monitor is that we basically embed a kind of, uh, a dynamic modeling and sim simulation of the robot state. So basically on every calculation of the command that is coming from the software, we predict or estimate what will be the one step ahead or sometimes, uh, I mean, depending on how much accuracy we will have, what will be the next step uh, of the robot uh, in terms of position, velocity, motor positions. And then um, we, consider, uh, we actually uh, try to detect if that actually violates any of the safety constraints, it actually causes a kind of unsafe movement to happen. So, this, in a sense, actually combines both the current state of the robot, which we have the from physical uh, uh, robot and motor controller, motor encoders, but also tries to kind of um, consider the uncertainties and dynamics of the robot behavior in this model that we have developed. So I should just mention that in this model, we only, uh, although the robot is seven degrees of freedom, we only model the first three joints, which are the shoulder, elbow, and the tool insertion. So that by itself, because we are only doing three out of seven degrees of freedom, it uh, actually doesn't have the uh, perfect accuracy in kind of modeling, but it still gives us better um, uh, kind of detection coverage or like kind of accuracy in detection of the events compared to a threshold based approach. 
So basically we um, model this, uh, the, the dynamics of the joints, the first three joints, as well as the um, motor and cable dynamics. So this robot is a kind of a cable driven robot. So we also try to uh, model based on the kind of um, um, uh, previous work and also expect that we have for this uh, motor controllers, uh, the dynamics of the uh, motor uh, encoders and controllers. And then uh, what we do is that uh, in order to actually, as I said, in order to test our monitor, uh, we do the kind of testing within a simulation environment. So we have extended, basically we got the control uh, system of the Raven, uh, control software of the Raven. We don't do any changes to that. Uh, but the only change we do is that we actually integrate it with a, a master console emulator, which could be a kind of a motion planner. We actually have two different versions. Uh, one is a motion planner that can just generate new trajectories for a kind of a, a task that we have in mind, the task goal. But the other one is actually just a kind of replaying the previous trajectories that have been done by some um, uh, kind of human operator. So we have actually surgical residents coming to our lab and they actually do uh, some standard tasks from uh, uh, robotic surgery training tasks, and they, we collect their trajectory data, the kinematics and vision data, and then our simulator can replay them back in the simulated environment. So we integrate this control software with that a motion planner and the emulator, and also with a kind of the ROS gazebo uh, 3D environment, and then we can replay back uh, kind of a simulation of the task. Then uh, what we do is also we um, uh, use the kind of the models, the uh, dynamic, models of the motors and uh, kind of the joints that I explained in the previous slide uh, in, integrated with the control thread so that the commands that were are delivered to the actual uh, interface boards and they go to the motor controllers they also deliver they're also delivered to the simulated model so at the same time we can actually see um, the action uh, on the actual robot but also we can see it in the the predicted action on the uh, in the simulator that we have and then we integrate this whole simulator with a kind of a fault injection engine. So this fault injection is a kind of a common approach in dependability for mimicking the impact of the hardware and software faults and then basically create artificial faults in the system to see how the system behaves in the presence of faults. And then our injection framework in this case can create safety hazards. So basically we try to inject faults so that we mimic the same sort of safety hazards that we have seen in the data or we have done an analysis um, based on the system. Uh, it can inject faults into like the different threads in the system, into the input and output, uh, different locations, and it's very programmable uh, kind of fault injector. Um, and one challenge actually we had here was that because this is a kind of a system that um, needs to be kind of a, both the hardware and software components are involved, we actually need to also make some changes to the hardware components of the system to be able to uh, restart the software fault injections that we do uh, from one experiment to the other. So we had mechanisms for also kind of doing that. Uh, but yeah, but basically this framework um, enables us to do kind of millions or thousands of fault injections and then restart the system automatically and just log everything and then do the experiments. So here is a kind of a demo of uh, kind of our simulator uh, in the gazebo environment. So here we are doing a task of block transfer is a very basic task in robotic surgery training. Um, the kind of the resident or um, the participant is supposed to pick up an uh, uh, object and then uh, take it to the destination and drop it in that uh, kind of uh, destination that we have. So um, here you see a kind of a case that we don't have any faults and you see that we have also a kind of a camera here. So this is a kind of a 3D uh, uh, camera that uh, it has depth perception. So we have this actual camera in the lab but we also have added the model of it into the ROS gazebo and we can actually record simulated um, camera um, uh, virtual, we, have, we can actually record the virtual camera uh, frames from this, um, let me see if I have it here. I, I think I have it in the next slide, I show how it looks like the kind of the data recorded from that virtual camera. So the, here is how we actually simulate the safety hazards. So for example, uh, we, we did uh, in our DSM 2016 paper, we actually did uh, injection of the faults into the commands that are coming from the surgeon console or to the commands that are going to the hardware controllers. And you see that here we are just to a kind of a small glitch, like a kind of unexpected large value being sent to the, um, basically as a, to the DAC, uh, like digital to under converters, like torque values. And you see here the effect of that on our in the simulation. So this is showing that we will have a kind of a job or a kind of big value on the motor, the first motors that we are simulating in our simulator. And then that will translate in the actual robot into 
uh, kind of a, a small jump more than one millimeter uh, in the in the factor positions of the robot. So in the XYZ position, you will get a, actually a kind of a jerky movement. And actually, when we simulate this on the, in the uh, robot, depending on what is the value and the duration of the error or the kind of that we are injecting, you might actually have the robot to um, kind of make an abrupt jump and then the cables break. So depending on uh, what is the value or what time it's actually happening, you might actually have some damage to the robot as well. So here you see the view from that camera, virtual camera, that we can actually record every simulation experiment. And here we are injecting a fault, another fault that uh, as we are going to the destination, um, if I remember correctly, this is a grasper angle kind of error that um, the block is dropped, which is an unintentional drop. If we can actually consider it as a kind of failure, it's not probably safety critical, but it's, um, it just shows that how we can um, record the demonstration from the virtual camera that we have in the ROS Gazebo simulator. So yeah, anyway, so for the uh, for our first monitor, which is combining the uh, cyber and physical context together, we did experiments uh, simulating two different attack scenarios. We assumed the attacker, and there is more about the attack part uh, in our paper. I'm not talking about it now, but um, so the attacker actually will deploy a malware that at critical times it knows exactly when is a critical time during surgery. It will inject um, kind of. Uh, add values into the commands that are coming from the surgeon to the control software or the commands that are going from the control software to the physical robot. And then we also tried with different uh, error values with different activation periods. And depending on that, actually the attack might be successful or not. And uh, at the end, we actually compared the uh, accuracy of this technique compared to the basic threshold based uh, safety checks that Raven has. Um, that's the only kind of comparison that we had in, with this system in the literature uh, and try to compare it in terms of both a fun score, TPR, uh, true positive rate and false positive rate. So in general, we did much better than Raven. Uh, we had also, this came with, because there's always a trade-off, we also came with a kind of more false positives that we had. But one thing I should note here is that we were always detecting before the hazard was happening. So because we were actually preventing, we were using our simulator to detect one step ahead and then try to uh, kind of um, detect the hazard before it actually has happened on the physical robot, we were preventive versus Raven uh, most of the time actually detected this after the jump already happened in the physical robot in the next cycle, once the sensing was done and it saw that actually the robot has made a bad movement, then it raised an error. So one big difference was that we were actually preventive, but also we improved the um, uh, fun score. Um, so one of the things that we uh, wanted to do next was to basically improve uh, the accuracy, try, hopefully try to decrease this false positive rate and also be early in detection by adding to the uh, notion of context that we have. So most of the work, including our own work in the CPS literature, when they do anomaly detection or say security monitoring, they kind of work on this concept of combining physical and cyber context as we did here. But what, uh, but what, what is, um, I think I've, have, at least I've not seen so far that we do in this work is that we try to combine also the operational context into the um, design of the monitor. And by operational context in terms of surgery, I think this is something that actually depends on the medical CPS that we are considering. So in case of surgery, it's very specific to surgical workflow. We, we do the same for other applications that I talked about before, like for, uh, for example, uh, artificial pancreas system. For that, I need to define it differently, but it's very application dependent. But in case of surgery, uh, we define it in terms of um, what, what, the what the operator is actually intending to do in, at each stage in the procedure. So basically we try to um, uh, uh, look at the surgery as a kind of a hierarchy, starting from the procedure that is going on, the steps in the procedure, the tasks, and then the specific surgical gestures that are being operated uh, by the robot. And um, we use this information for the design of the monitor. So this is not something that we invited. Uh, it's something like uh, um, kind of known in the literature. So in 2011, uh, in the surgical literature, for example, this was the kind of the hierarchy that was proposed. So basically you can break down any surgical procedure into multiple, smaller steps. And uh, with this, you can actually create a library of different surgical procedures and then uh, atomic building blocks of those. And in fact, actually at John Hopkins in your department, um, there is a kind of a project on language of surgery and also like the kind of a standard grammar graphs that are built for some of the common tasks um, in um, robotic surgery. So we actually, um, for our, one of our data sets that we use for evaluation is also 
uh, the data set um, jigsaw from J John Hopkins University that um, has the dry lab um, demonstrations of the tasks of suturing, needle passing, and knot tying. And then uh, we use the same a standard um, gesture uh, kind of notations that is proposed in this paper by, from this, this department that uh, basically defines this kind of atomic building blocks in kind of different surgical tasks. They call it surgical um, surgimes or gestures. And then um, we use this for kind of defining what, what we mean by a kind of open, basically try to quant, um, break down our um, operation of workflow in surgery. So uh, here is a kind of a demonstration of uh, um, a task of suturing on Da Vinci research kit from the Jigsaw data set. Uh, you see that um, uh, on the right side, uh, this video that shows the kind of uh, suturing is broken down into this kind of a standard gestures. And um, we use this as one of our data kind of um, uh, sets that we use for analysis of our work. Uh, the other data that we have is actually from our own uh, Raven robot. So what we do is that we actually do different um, tasks uh, for, for this paper, we just did a block transfer, which is a kind of a simpler one, but we also actually have um, robotic surgeons and residents actually from UVA hospital come to our lab and we do uh, lots of kind of uh, a standard uh, uh, simulation tasks uh, on our uh, DB trainer that we have in the lab. And we collect uh, kinematics vision data, and also we, uh, we also can replay them as you see here in the virtual simulation environment. So you see that here, the kind of uh, actual surgery, kind of a small procedure that this block transfer task is one of the simplest uh, training modules in surgery, but it's actually a very common step in any procedure. You need to actually pick up something and then deliver it to uh, some other location. And, um, sometimes it might be a needle that actually, it, if you drop it, it might be actually safety critical. So, um, and you see on the lower uh, videos that uh, we have the simulation of the same task in our uh, gazebo simulator. And also we break it down into the ge standard gestures that are defined in the Jigsaw's uh, paper. And um, so what we do uh, uh, in this work that is actually new compared to the uh, definition of the gestures, is that we try to identify the errors that are specific to every gesture or a step in the procedure. So, um, so the gesture kind of a segmentation for the uh, procedure and also all the kind of classification of gestures based on kinematics or video data has been done a lot in the literature, but most of the people who have done it, they're actually either looking into a skill evaluation or they're trying to actually use it for uh, learning from demonstration or generating new data. So what we do differently here is that we want to use um, the notion of gestures in order to identify the patterns or like the common error patterns that happen with them. And our hypothesis is that if we can actually detect the erroneous gesture, we can differentiate them uh, from normal gestures, the gestures that are done maybe according to what the expert will do, then we, can, we might be able to detect early signs of adverse events before they happen. And we looked a lot into the literature, into surgery literature, in order to find out how we can define errors. And we also talked a lot with our robotic surgeon collaborators at UVA. And uh, one of the very common, one of the most common uh, kind of rubrics that we found uh, was this paper by Joyce in 1998, and many other papers actually refer to that. This is from endoscopic surgery, and they defined the errors in surgery into two categories, like procedure errors that are uh, more about like the rearrangement of the steps or like uh, kind of omission or like kind of um, um, the sequence of gestures that are happening in the procedure. I mean, in this case, they say steps, they don't go to the gesture level, but basically the errors one to six that are more about the kind of the procedure itself, they're kind of how the sequence of event, uh, events or steps are done. And then another category is the execution errors. Um, when you go to every gesture or step itself, now not the ordering of them, but every execution, if that step by itself is actually done correctly or not. And um, this is more kind of uh, specific to the, that kind of motion that is being performed. And for example, if there is too much force, too little force or different kind of um, or the distance or the time and everything. So in this work, we are actually looking on, um, on different categories of errors. But in this work specifically, we focus on execution errors. So if, if we know what is the gesture that is being performed, is the execution of that gesture correct or not? And, um, and this rubric that we have in the paper is actually still evolving. So just after this paper published, we are still adding into like new other types of errors that might be kind of related to every gesture. 
And one thing I should mention is that these gestures I'm showing here, these are kind of atomic blocks. They're like instructions in a program, in a computer software program that uh, is your procedure or like kind of surgery. And uh, we are trying to find what are those kind of errors that are specific to each instruction or like this building block. But uh, there are also errors that might happen depend across, I mean, over for your whole program or your whole task. So here I'm just showing the gesture specific errors, but there are errors that also might happen that involve um, um, the type of task that you're doing. So for example, depending on like if it's suturing or needle passing or not tying, the, there might be new types of errors that I might consider for G1, or there might be errors that actually affect multiple gestures together. So here we are not looking at those kind of correlated errors or like errors that are at the task layer. We are just looking at the every gesture. And, um, but that work is actually ongoing. That actually would be very interesting to look at the kind of higher level. So in this paper, we actually try to, in the, uh, recent one, we try to actually basically extend the um, uh, gesture library from Jigsaws with this kind of common gesture specific errors. And then uh, these are errors that we think that we can quantify based on basically try to detect based on uh, kinematics or vision data. So if there is something that we cannot probably uh, detect it based on just looking at vision or kinematics, we try to not include it. So there are errors that are very kind of qualitative and not easy to quantify. We don't include them here. So oh, can, can we ask questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. sure. um, like at what granularity are you working on? Because it's like, are you doing it based on a gesture? Like you know what the gesture is going to be and then mm -hmm. check if there is an error? Yes. Or you look at a continuous surgery and you try to detect issues there? No, so in this work, as I said, we are looking, we are looking at a specific gesture. But what we found recently is that is very interesting is that we also need to look at the kind of the step and basically the sequence of gestures, but also like at the bigger picture of the gestures. As I said, if you think of it as a procedure is like a computer program, and then each of these steps are like a kind of instruction or like a function call in that program. So now we are looking at only those instructions or function calls that are wrong. But the program itself might actually has a might have an error that might across might be across multiple instructions, or it might be something kind of logical that across the whole program is happening. Now we are only at the building blocks, the atomic building blocks, and um, and this is ongoing actually research on like how to define errors, and it's actually a lot of it is actually we need help from surgeons because there is lots of it also is about the style because different people do it differently. So you can always define it based on what, how experts do it and, um, or you can learn from the data from experts. But, and also one thing I should mention is that in the literature on a skill evaluation in surgery, uh, most of people are concerned mainly about uh, efficiency metrics. And um, there is only like, we found only a couple of works in robotic surgery specifically that they try to differentiate between safety and efficiency. So there are some of these things that if they happen, they're absolutely safety critical, but there are some that they just lead to your score to go low. So you're not that efficient, uh, but there is no safety issue. So we also are trying to more look at things that are really causing safety issues or they cause adverse events if they're not stopped. Um, yeah. Do you have some assumption about how you decide that they, there is an error? Like, is it like a certain movement that is not, you know, doesn't fit the pattern or because if it's like a mild thing, you will never know unless you are really a surgeon that there is an error here, is it, isn't it? So yeah, that's why, for example, for the different tasks, there are actually checklists that are defined in the literature. So they, for example, I, my, I think I'm, I, maybe have it here but maybe towards the end of my slide I can have show it let me see if I have it now so actually me, do you see my screen or I should share again I think so for example this is a kind of a checklist uh, which is cited a lot in the literature and surgery for task of suturing so this is actually what they do. They have checklists in like surgery that they check. And this is actually a specification of how people are supposed to learn and do things. And you see that it's very specific. Like it talks about what is the distance from the tip of the needle? What is the angle um, kind of how you should actually enter the tissue? So when we talk to the surgeons, we define the errors. Actually, the kind of errors they also define is very related to this checklist. So if they, you see, for example, uh, that the resident is not picking the needle at the right distance from the tip, that's an error. 
so the instructor will consider that's actually not good. Or if you, for example, do um, the wrong angle or you do multiple push with the wrong force. So we try to actually, as I said, define it in a way that we can quantify it either using vision or with kinematics data. So using, using kinematics variable that we have, otherwise we cannot detect it, right? So it should be quantifiable. Um, there are lots of um, scoring systems and rubrics in surgery that they actually don't, um, they're not quantitative. They're just watching the video. They try to say it's good or bad. We are, we are not doing that. We are trying to make it qu quantitative kind of uh, measurement. And actually that's one of the things that we think we might actually contribute to the certification and also training of the surgeons because if we can quantify and then give them more reason, that would be better. Um, anyway, so we, I don't know if you answered the question. Can, uh, yeah, thank you. Sure. So then, so, okay. So in order to actually, so our hypothesis here is that yes, if I go gesture level and I define the errors, then um, actually our hypothesis is that the errors are gesture specific. So, and in order to test this, we did some preliminary studies of in our ISMR paper, which was before DSN, we actually tried to first detect the gestures from the kinematics data and go to each, each gesture and try to actually estimate the distributions of the erroneous gestures that we have using Gaussian kernel methods. And then we try to find what are the differences, I mean, basically quantify the difference or divergence between error distributions of different gestures from the data. And what we found is that usually there is very high divergence between, uh, at least with the common gestures that we had enough data on them, because there are some gestures that we don't have enough data to estimate the distribution. But with those that we have enough data, there is actually a high divergence or high um, uh, entropy uh, difference between the distributions of the different erroneous gesture classes. We also found that um, if you define this kind of safety constraints for every gesture in terms of, for example, what is the limits of position orientation or force, then the thresholds or like the limits or bounds that you find for every gesture is different from the other one. So that, that provides us with some early motivation or kind of background uh, kind of evidence that yes, this um, errors are gesture specific. It depends on um, what, what, what I'm doing to define it. And we need to actually learn it from the past data based on the gestures. But we are, as I said, we are still kind of investigating this. Actually, we have, we are just doing another analysis based on jigsaws and Raven data to see if you can see more signs of uh, kind of this divergence or kind of hypothesis that we have. Um, so based on this kind of hypothesis that we have so far, and then we want to include gestures for error detection, we designed this pipeline for anomaly detection, which we call it a context aware in anomaly detection. So the pipeline, how it works is that we have both the kinematics data, uh, basically uh, from the robot uh, uh, instruments, as well as like the human or operator, like uh, joint positions, uh, end effector positions, velocities and orientations. And we also have the video frames or the data of the tasks that the surgeon is doing. Uh, we use the video data only for annotation. So basically just to go and watch the video and see when the errors are happening and try to label them. We don't want to use the video data for our detection because of the limitations that I talked about. So there are lots of times that the video is not showing everything that is going on in surgery. So the, or is like there, not, there is a poor uh, vision or other conditions. And also the good thing is that the video can show us a kind of a, give us an independent way of labeling the data. And we can also automate the labeling sometimes uh, based on using computer vision techniques. So for our design of a monitor, we just, it uses the time series kinematics data and it does two, uh, uses two different classifiers. The first classifier, it will just uh, guess a, a window of times, uh, kind of a sliding window of time series data, and then tries to identify the boundaries of a gesture. So we actually have trained this uh, um, classifier on the Jigsaw's data and also on Raven data. And in real time, it can detect when is the start and end of each, each gesture in the time series data. And as I said, this is also done by others. But what is different in our work is that we only use the kinematics data and we try to be in real time. So we want to actually detect the gesture as soon as it's happening. We, because if we are late, then we will be late in our detection. So these are two things that are different from a state of the art in that manner. The other thing is that after we detect what is the gesture, a condition of what is the gesture that we know for this uh, window of time, we go and uh, select from one of the uh, several gesture, uh, erroneous gesture classifiers that we have. So basically we go and train for every gesture class that we have a classifier that can tell us if that gesture, the time series data for a gesture that we're getting, is it safe or unsafe? Is one of those errors that we have, have has been observed or not? 
And then once I know which gesture um, I have in the kinematic state, so I go and load one of these classifiers and then that classifier will tell me if there is any unsafe behavior happening or not. And then um, most of the time, I mean, not most of the time, I should say maybe on average, we are always like within like one, millis uh, one second of the time that uh, we see there is an unsafe behavior. And then sometimes we are early. And if we can actually, uh, we don't know actually, we, we need another study to see how long does it take from the erroneous gesture until the actual adverse event or failure to happen. But if we assume that there is enough time, at least more than maybe a kind of couple of seconds to act the actual complication to happen, then probably this is a good uh, uh, kind of enough time to provide alerts to the surgeon or just try to provide actually a kind of a corrective action, basically stop this command from happening to prevent harm. So one of the things that we need to actually um, assess further is to see how long does it take to really have the, that impact on the patient? And that's something probably that can come from the studies with the real patient data and so on. But uh, okay, so what we do for each of these kind of uh, classifiers is that for the surgical gesture classification, we have multivariate time series data, including Cartesian position, rotation metrics, grasper angles, and joint angles. And then we train uh, RNNs, recurrent neural nets uh, that have a stack layers of LSTMs uh, with an output uh, ReLU layer for the kind of activation. And then um, once, so we use this for the classification of gesture. Once we know what is the gesture, then we load one of the uh, binary classifiers for the erroneous gesture classifier. So this is more a kind of a conditional event detection, given that I know this is the gesture, is it safe or unsafe? And we use uh, LSTMs and 1D CNNs for doing uh, this task. And finally, we compare our erroneous gesture, I mean, the performance of erroneous gesture classifier to also a classifier that doesn't have any notion of gesture. So because our hypothesis was that if we know what is a gesture, we can do better. We compare to a classifier that doesn't know anything about gestures, it just get, gets the uh, time series data and try to detect errors. So um, for our evaluation, we used, as I said, two different data sets, one from Jigsaw's, the suturing task that uh, was from John Hopkins data set. And we also did uh, demonstrations of the block transfer task on Raven and we simulated them on our simulator. Then we injected faults on these demonst uh, fault-free demonstrations and we generated also faulty versions of those demonstrations that they will have different kinds of failures. And uh, because in DigiCosos data by default, there are human errors that actually show failures that we want to detect, but in our fault-free demonstrations on Raven, we didn't have those faults, so we created them artificially. So then for the grant root data, uh, we use the video. So in both these data sets, we have video data. And uh, what we do is that we both uh, label the boundaries of the gesture and also the time, exact time that the error happened in the frame of the video. And then we try to synchronize it with the kinematics data. For the suturing on DVRK, uh, because it's all, I mean, we just have the data, uh, nothing else. We just manually annotated the video. But for the Raven, because we were doing fault injections ourselves, we actually used a combination of our fault injection times because we know when the fault is going to, uh, is injected after that probably a failure happens. And then uh, also we used uh, automated um, computer vision techniques in order to detect the errors uh, from the simulated uh, video data. So I will talk about this a little bit more uh, in, in a few slides. And then, uh, as I said, because our classifier, uh, we want to also make sure that our monitor can be in real time. It can quickly detect the gestures and the errors. We also came up with, in addition to the standard accuracy metrics, we came up with two metrics for measuring timeliness. So one is jitter, which is in real time systems usually kind of measures the latency and for the periodic tasks. So we kind of use it for timely detection of gestures. And then another metric which is similar is reaction time for early detection of errors. We call it reaction time because similar to like autonomous cars from the time that you kind of uh, detect something and you send an alert until the time that hazard happens, that's the budget that you have for doing anything uh, helpful to kind of prevent that hazard. So that's why we call it reaction time. Um, uh, so, okay, so for fault injections, um, uh, we did um, using the same kind of tool I showed you before. We injected both um, accidental or malicious faults, um, basically created faults that mimic the accidental or malicious faults or human errors by corrupting the kinematics of state variables in the control software. So we did a total of 650 fault injections, and then we tried to create these two failure scenarios 
one that the block when we are trying to move it to the destination is dropped at the wrong time or when it actually goes very close to the destination it's when it's going to drop off it doesn't drop off at the wrong right time or kind of uh, basically um, it doesn't drop off or it actually is the wrong um, time uh, so what we found actually in our previous uh, study from ISMR is that in our fault injections that there is all uh, sometimes there is a window of time at least in our when we inject a fault until the intensity of fault is enough for the failure to happen. So for example, if I change the value of the grasper angle or like a kind of another kinematics state variable, it doesn't, the failure doesn't happen immediately. It takes some time until the failure happens. So we are hoping that that time, that is actually a time that we have for detecting. That's actually a kind of a chance to do anything uh, for our monitor to detect things and be early. But as I said, we cannot always be early because we also might be late because of our gesture detection. So, so one of the things about um, for the annotation, I mentioned about the computer vision techniques. So label- oh, Mark, can I, um, yeah. how long, I mean, because we are running for an hour now, we have yeah. some robotics experts here that we yeah. would want to have some conversation, I guess. Yeah, sure. So maybe you should plan the time. Yeah, so I will wrap it, oh, sorry. Yeah, thanks for the time idea. So I will wrap it up in five minutes, right? So uh, if if that's okay. Um, so yeah, so let me just jump on this. So, okay. So here are our kind of our, our kind of final results. Uh, so we compared our gesture classification to the state of the art works that only consider kinematics data. And then we achieve comparable accuracy to them. We also uh, kind of measure the jitter time. Uh, it's not exactly like kind of perfect with the state of the art, but it's very close. And we also achieve kind of a, a jitter time of in order of milliseconds. So we are still, I mean, in terms of suturing, we are actually positive means that we are early. In terms of block transfer, we actually are kind of late on average. And then uh, we usually have better accuracy whenever we have more samples, obviously for our machine learning model. We, did, we actually compared the anomaly detection performance to non-gesture specific method that I talked about. And most uh, in our experiments, without having the gesture classification in the loop, when we have perfect gestures, we achieved better performance compared to a non-gesture specific classifier. But when we have the overall pipeline together, end-to-end -end pipeline together, uh, we see that the, obviously the gesture classification performance affects the anomaly detection performance. So if we are not accurate, we detect gestures wrongly, or we are late in the detecting the gestures, then the uh, final outcome from the monitor is affected. So on average, uh, we could detect uh, errors um, with uh, 76 to 88% accuracy, uh, F1 score. And um, reaction time was within 1.7 seconds. So it was different from, for black transfer versus uh, suturing. Um, so one thing that was interesting was that for the non-gesture specific, uh, we actually sometimes had better reaction time. I think the problem, again, main problem here was that because we had delays when we were doing gesture kind of detection, we had delays in identifying the gesture and then that caused the kind of delay in our uh, kind of uh, reaction time too. Um, and finally, this is actually our a video of our, how our monitor works in practice. So you see that this is a kind of video from, I don't know why it doesn't play. Let me see if I... I don't know why it doesn't play. Just let me stop the share. Yeah, so I get, I'm sorry for, for some reason my video doesn't play. But anyway, so our safety monitor in action, what it does is that, um, um, is that actually while the kind of this task is going on, it actually can show you what is exactly the gesture that is happening. And also if there is a kind of any violations of the safety constraints in real time. So basically it's a kind of like a feedback to the surgeon or the trainee as he's doing the task to see if there is any kind of violations or any of the errors that we had is happening. Um, so I think that's it. And the way we are following up in this work is actually we are trying to now coming up with a synthesis technique uh, for automating the generation of the logic for the monitor 
uh, so that we can combine not only the data that we have from the data sets, but also the kind of the knowledge uh, kind of that we have from the surgeons. So basically the kind of the graphs that we get from the surgeons on the tasks and the kind of error constraints, how to combine it with the data so that we can achieve better performance than a machine learning that doesn't have any knowledge of the uh, surgeon practices. And um, more on that later. Uh, thank you, everyone. And um, again, also thanks to my students in our group, uh, my PhD students, and also our uh, the funding agency that support our work. And I guess I'm four minutes over time. Sorry for that. Uh, available for questions now. Okay. Anybody has uh, questions here, to Oma? Okay, so actually when we when I asked you before about are you gesture specific, you say, yeah, we're only looking at the gesture, but what you just was about to show, actually that was like the whole thing when you try to understand what is the gesture and then see, so that is actually looking at the whole operation in a way and understanding by yourself what the gesture is, isn't it? Yeah, so we actually can, as I said, these are the building blocks of the whole procedure. So once we can detect for every gesture, if it's good or bad, we can do it for a whole procedure. So whenever we have that gesture, we can say, is this safe or not safe? I mean, I leave it to the robotic people, but to me, that looks like completely different because one is saying, okay, I'm going to do this gesture right now, and you tell me if I'm good or bad. Mm -hmm. And the other one is like, it's up to you to decide what the gesture even is. So that, that looks to me like a completely different problem, much so, harder. So the video that you saw, for example, was suturing, right? So when the person does it, it actually does these different gestures with different transitions. So they might actually take different paths. But then as the kinematics data is happening, we can detect when is the gesture one, when is gesture five. And then for every gesture, we can say, was it done correctly or not? Okay. I don't know if it answers your question. Maybe I'm... Um, this, this is Russ Taylor. Um, Hi. Yeah. Interesting. One of the things, it seems to me there's a big difference between detecting and doing something about errors that have to do with the internal functioning of the system mm -hmm. and uh, more intentional errors that really have to do with tool to tissue interactions and relationships. Mm -hmm. Now, what you're doing with this gesture, if I understood you, you're, you're still only looking at kinematic data. Yes. So, which is not really conditioned on uh, anything to do with, with the environment that that motion is being done in. Yeah, so our notion of context, if I, if I uh, showed it here, yeah. it doesn't consider the environment yet, and that is actually missing. Yeah, and, and it seems to me that's a big problem. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, if you're looking only at kinematic data, uh, mm -hmm. I guess my question is when you went and trained your anomaly detector, uh, mm -hmm. uh, what happens if the, the correct gesture uh, is not within kind of the training set that you trained on? Because you, you, you would seem like you would need to train your kinematic jet, um, manipulation uh, across a very wide arrangement of uh, positions, orientations, scales, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So uh, what, what do you think the limits uh, that you have are? You, you're asking about the gesture classification part or the- well, No, no, no. I assume you even know that this is um, uh, uh, the bite state stage of a, of a, a suturing task. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, the, the, the kinematic motion mm -hmm that you need to do that uh, mm -hmm. is really depends quite a lot on uh, the on the posture of the uh, of the tissues you're manipulating and a number of other factors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, uh, so if you're if you're you it seems like you need to guarantee that you have 
a large enough sampling so that that you your your training of what is normal for that gesture uh, encompasses all of the uh, relationship that that you're likely to have for that gesture in, in um, surgery. Yeah, so I'm not so training. How, how, and it didn't seem to me your training set was really very large. So, mm -hmm, no, yeah, that's, so like, how, that's a problem. How, how do you deal with that? So yeah, so actually that's a good point. So we are, I'm, I'm not claiming here that we are accounting for so kind of the tool tissue kind of interactions or anything that is in the real surgery environment. As you saw, we are actually just yeah, doing- yeah, but That wasn't my question. My question was uh, if you're, when you do your training, even on this artificial block transfer task, mm -hmm. uh, the physical positioning at, of the blocks and the in the environment and uh, the necessary approach angles and so forth uh, can vary quite a lot. And yeah. uh, a gesture may look very atypical simply because you're doing it in a different place than you did it before. So. How, how were you able to get a wide enough uh, selection of uh, typical uh, trajectories uh, to deal with that? So for the block transfer, because we did it in simulation, we fixed the environment. So the environment is very, I mean, the, the right, but, is, but, everything but, is fixed. Right, and, but, yeah. but then, well, how, okay. And then, and then how, how dependent is your technique on having a very fixed environment? I think right now it's very dependent. Yes, if you actually add the kind of the dynamics of the tissues and the kind of objects moving, then yeah, as I said, there will be like one thing that I'm not modeling here. Um, and in our case, you ask about how you actually, that's another question I think you were asking about uh, basically how I can um, have diverse enough uh, data in my training set so that I can claim that I can actually capture all different right, kind of gesture mm -hmm. uh, variations. So again, that's also again limited to what I have. So basically we only relied on the jigsaws data because uh, and that, as you see, like our data is actually for some gestures that are not, that we don't have enough samples. It's very, our accuracy is very bad. And, um, yeah. and even, even like we know that limitations with machine learning kind of safety and security is that you're always limited to your training uh, set. If you see something new in your testing, that was not in the training or some new pattern, you will, be, you will do a very bad job on it. And of course, th that problem isn't unique yeah. to, to what you're doing, which I do think is really very, very interesting. Yeah. Especially I, if you could combine it with some kind of a planner that would kind of compute what the, the nominal ideal motion for. Anyhow, uh, I should let other people, I see Peter Kazanzidis right. and other robotics. Yeah. Hi, 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 good to see hi. you again, Uma. Yeah. Um, yeah. I guess we would have seen each other again at ISMR. Uh, yeah, there, I think it was yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, thanks for the talk. Uh, I think so. One of the, uh, this in a way is related uh, to what Russ was just talking about. Um, I've worked with a lot of surgeons, and they really don't like it when your system doesn't let them do things, you know, because mm -hmm. surgery can be pretty unstructured and they sometimes have to do unusual things that in many contexts would be considered unsafe, but are actually necessary for safety or for that specific uh, patient. You know, one example I had, you know, back in the days of Robodoc, which was a robot for hip surgery, um, we could tell if they were trying to plan, some, some hip implants are designed, let's say just for a left or a right leg, and we could tell, oh, we, we could prevent them from putting a left implant in a right leg. And in fact, at one point we introduced that safety feature. Makes sense, right? Why would yeah. you do that? However, <laughs> we quickly got uh, criticized for that because sometimes the, the, there was some unusual anatomical variations and their solution was to put a left implant in a right hip. And, and so these are the kinds of things that I think are, are, are challenging. And so I think, you know, if you if you just put a little display on the screen, they can ignore that. If you say you're doing something unsafe, but now you know, have you have you gotten any feedback from from surgeons yeah. about you know, will would they be willing to accept accept the limitation? You know, the system will not let me continue surgery because it detects that I'm doing something unsafe. Yeah, so actually that's a very good point, and I always have this problem. Actually, even talking to them about like, tell me about the errors that might happen. So I'm lucky that I'm working uh, with one of the surgeons that we are collaborating with. He's actually an educator also at UVA. 
So he actually is supposed to certify the residents uh, with like what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So he's kind of actually, when I watch him, he sits at the console with a dual console. And then what, when the resident is doing the task, he actually is giving monitoring him and say, oh, you should do this now, you should do that now. Or he tries to actually intervene sometimes, try to help him. So maybe sometime, actually somehow this idea also came from watching him. So it's like, it, you can also think of this as a kind of a virtual coach. So in like healthcare, the, like this is actually this new idea about like how you can have a virtual agent or like kind of um, um, smart agent to be a kind of coaching you as you're doing your task. I mean, I, I agree with you that we always push back, especially if you want to stop them or like give them so much alert. But the way I'm, we are taking this as a kind of, we are taking baby steps is that we are first trying to use this in training because if you, I mean, you, you know that in DB Trainer and like in Mimic DB Trainer also in like Da Vinci, they already actually give a scores at the end of the module, every module to the trainer, trainees saying that how they did in different kind of metrics that they have. And if you actually look into the Mimic TV trainer, they actually have like in their latest version, they have both safety and efficiency metrics. And some of the safety metrics they have are very similar to the things that we are actually learning from basically in terms of force kind of position orientation. So they actually measure this in real time at the end, they give them a score by comparing what is the average, for example, value of the force in that step that an expert actually had. So they measured all these metrics or parameters from a group of expert surgeons and they compare every resident who's taking that module and give them a score at the end. What, one thing we are trying to do is that what if we don't give the score at the end, we give it in real time as, this, as the person is doing the task and then maybe that can enforce the right behavior as they're actually, in term, I mean, taking, I mean, doing the task. Mm -hmm. And the first step, of, I mean, yeah, we had lots of pushback even at UVA was, I mean, I'm trying, I mean, even from our surgeons, they say, oh, I don't like somebody tell me like what the steps are. I mean, they also say the same thing you said that sometimes they might take different paths because they just, is there a style? And um, so we were thinking maybe first to, there are two things. One is that we want to first do it in training and try to see how learn from that experience to see what how we can uh, kind of um, help them. Should we send alerts or should we fix things? But another thing also you mentioned is more low level in the kind of the way that we are doing this technique is that we are looking at every gesture and we're very kind of uh, zoomed mm -hmm. into every uh, yeah. step way that there is wrong. That that problem is yeah. Yeah, I mean I think it's it is a hard problem to basically try to detect when this search, you know, it's, it's easier to detect the machine is doing something wrong. I told it to move yeah. left and it's moving right. Yeah. But if I tell it to move left and that's wrong, it's hard to really detect that as an error. And, yeah. uh, and, and that also leads back to when you started your presentation, you're really talking about, you know, if you're going to do remote telesurgery, which generally isn't done these days, but then, yeah, you have to be concerned about maybe a malicious attack in the middle. And, and so then it becomes, you know, if, if you can't really, you have to be able to detect, okay, is, is the robot being told to move left because the surgeon is doing that because it's really important in this case, even though my algorithms tell me he shouldn't do that, or is it being told to move left because somebody's intervened and it's actually a malicious mm -hmm. command? That's, that's gonna be, a, a, I, I feel a real challenge because surgeons aren't gonna wanna be prevented from doing an action, yet you want to try to detect if there's been some sort of a breach. Although I, I would add, this, I mean, I agree with you, but I would add to something that sometimes actually it doesn't, I mean, yes, there are cases that you want to actually differentiate, but in some cases mm -hmm. there's obvious safety critical issue, probably doesn't matter if it was a failure kind of security attack or a human error. You just want mm -hmm. to stop that kind of, kind of harm from happening. But yeah, I agree with you that sometimes if the surgeon really wants to do something that looks like safety critical but is needed, we don't want our system to prevent it. So I guess, yeah, so I guess that would be more, there are two aspects of it. One is that how we want to actually deliver this or kind of integrate it mm -hmm. with the surgical workflow. Uh, the way I see it is the first maybe a step is to just in, in yeah. integrate it with the training. Uh, but the other one the more problem is that I think I, I see that the problem that if you want to be really a specific kind of uh, stick to this kind of grammar graph or like kind of exactly this path. So one of the things we are also looking into is that how we can, so there actually, you can think of this also as a kind of this uh, kind of markup chain is that they have transition probabilities and different surges. Actually, when we did the jigsaws data, we tried to generate these graphs from the data and you see way more arcs around here. And there are some arcs that they have very low probability. And uh, some surgeons, when you look at his expert, he's doing fine, but he's not following this path, this kind of grammar graph. Mm -hmm. So this is basically, maybe basically you can say that this graph probably works for maybe 90% of people or like for maybe, I mean, you need to also consider like who is the person who is doing it. Maybe, 
even yeah. have on a personalized kind of safety trainer that learns about the style of the surgeon and kind of expertise level. But yeah, these are all kind of things that we need to basically right. solve. In no, but thank you. I, I realize that I've taken up way too much time. I, I'll let others yeah. ask. Well, thank you. Very good question. Um, I think we should let uh, Homa, thank Homa for an excellent talk and uh, for dropping by here and uh, release everybody. If you want to stay here with Homa for a few more minutes and ask her, uh, you're welcome to it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. And I very much appreciate more questions or comments. So it helps us to improve the work. No, I just want to say again, thank, thank you. And uh, it's, it's important. It's just, it's a really hard problem. It's, it's a very hard problem because, and I don't think there's going to be like an answer very soon because um, it, it is unstructured in a way, right? Not every yeah. case is a little bit different. And um, I think if, if it's a, if it, there will be class that is clearly wrong. Right, it's clearly wrong to do it. It's just that the fine grain thing are very hard to, you know, to tell the surgeon you're not doing it. Maybe, maybe you know, if you trust the surgeon, you, you can actually, and you have to, right? Mm. You can you can show something on the screen or or do you know yeah. some haptic feedback in some way, but they have to be able to do what they need to do. So yeah. Yeah. there always there generally has to be a manual override, you know, when, when you've got systems, you know, like like autopilots or whatever the the case is. And yeah. yeah. So I should add another thing I think you mentioned is that um, another trend that is going on with the water surgery, you know, is that people are trying to make it autonomous, like at least some tasks being done completely autonomous. And there is also yeah. pushback from surgeons on that. But yeah. I think that will happen anyway at some point, like as you see with the kind of, uh, maybe not the whole surgery, but some parts of it. And once mm -hmm. that happens, then it becomes really important for having these safety checks on the machine itself, like similar to what we have with like autopilot or like self-driving cars, like to make yeah. sure faults or security attacks are not happening. But I mean, I, I, yeah, I get blocked in both ways. Like if I want to go autonomous, they say, oh, I don't want to have autonomous. If I go this way, they don't want to hear about safety. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks again. Thank um, you for calling.